Welcome to a very special episode of Experience Focus Leaders Podcast with Dr. Timothy Chu. Timothy consults to Fortune 500 companies, serves on the boards of public companies like Teradata, was one of only three people to ever hold the title of president at a little company known as Oracle. Well, at Oracle, he led uh, the cloud computing initiative there and co-authored the first landmark book, End of Software. Um, on top of all these accomplishments, uh, Dr. Chu maintains teaching career at Stanford University for now 30 plus years. And on the side, he founded a couple of uh, startups, Pediatric Moonshot and Bevel Cloud. Dr. Chu, welcome to the pod. <laughs> well, thank you for having me, Alex. <laughs> Uh, you this is drop such a doctor. long list of accomplishments. This is like I, I like I think I'm gonna have to uh, rethink rethink what we do here. I mean, how do you um, how do you balance uh, actually such an interesting portfolio of initiatives, right? And like when I, I know I'm familiar with your Stanford class, you have everybody from you know Mark Benioff to you know CTO of Amazon there. So you have the who of who of publicly listed CEOs coming in. You have your own, uh, you know, portfolio of founding companies, right? You're, I didn't mention it, but, you know, we got connected through Alchemist Accelerator, you, where you're a chair. And so guide us a little bit on how do you do all this and yet find the time to mentor schmucks like myself who are trying to build our own businesses and are very generous with your time. Because I think that's sort of is how I envision myself, like being very active, you know, throughout the career and still giving back and you're kind of combining it all. Uh, any any advice for us, um, Timothy? Well, you know, I mean, I think this is a skill we all improve on and at all times, which is how do you compartmentalize? It's a lesson I learned. I was uh, on the staff of the guy who ran all of R&D and manufacturing for tandem computers. That was really the first place I was employed. And he talked a lot about the idea of compartmentalization, meaning can you walk into a meeting or an hour or a whatever and shut everything else out and focus on the thing that's in the compartment, in the mm -hmm. meeting, in the moment, whatever. So I think it's the skill of being able to do that, right? And, you know, we all learn, I mean, I'm not perfect at it, but you all learn to do that, to to walk in and put your full attention on the thing that you're wanting to put your full attention on and do that deliberately um, and shut everything else out because I think it's the noise of the everything else that's what makes things difficult and uh choose so, this to is really, the, so it's kind of building on that theme of the noise right so you have a pattern matching of the cloud computing industry from its inception um, and i'm pretty fortunate to have been at salesforce and then later at success factors i was a customer of yours uh, mm -hmm. where we bought you know oracle um cloud solutions at some point. And, uh, you know, I'd love to get your perspective on the volume of noise of innovation in the cloud computing, right? How do you break through all that? How do, how do you see the pace accelerating, decelerating with AI, you know, now or with other evolutions like mobile and so on coming in? Um, because there's very few people in, in the universe that could understand what's going on now and yet have the perspective of what was going on at the inception of the industry. Yeah. Uh, maybe that question slash comment has two kind of directions to it. Um, one is the, how do you cut through the noise? And I think the noise, we all, all know this, it's just gone up over time for two reasons. One, we have so many new media that didn't even exist 10 years ago, whether that's a Slack channel or, you know, YouTube or whatever, 10, 20 years ago. So we have so many more channels. Tech itself has become, I mean, when I started in this, 
it was all just a backroom operation. I mean, who the hell cared about computers? Mm. <laughs> and, you know, in the intervening, I've been at this now almost 40 years. Yeah, it's now front and center. I mean, you know, people are doing, uh, you know, congressional hearings on artificial intelligence. Like it's right. it's part of the fabric of the conversation pretty much everywhere. And so I think you take those two things together and it is hard. I think for any company, any new idea to cut through, it forces, and you and I have had this conversation, I think, which is how do you make the story simpler, more mm -hmm. targeted, right? Cleaner, better. It just forces you into that because there's so much more out there, obviously, um, in order to do this. Um, I think on the story of kind of the, yeah, I, I, you know, I was there at the beginning, right? When, when CIOs wanted to shake the cage that their computers were in. Right. <laughs> um, but the inevitability of this model is an inevitability really based on economics is what, you know, when I talk to the Stanford kids, I go, you have to really think about the transitions that we make are really economically driven every step of the way. The movement to microprocessors was an economic drive. Um, the movement to, you know, we'll call it uh, standardized databases, middleware is all economically driven. And in the end, the movement to delivering, you know, whether you want to think about it as compute and storage or applications as a service is economically driven, meaning it's far lower cost to be able to do that. Frankly, both for the builder of the software as well as for the purchaser of the software who no longer has to have an entire team to go manage security patches or whatever the hell it is, right? So right. that economic movement is afoot. It has been afoot. It will continue to be afoot. I think the thing on the horizon that I see is like, like you know, this whole, and I, AI I think is too broad a term because uh, as far as I can tell, sometimes you could just replace the word software yeah. And it would have the same meaning. Uh, yeah, software does cool stuff, right? Okay. Um, but I think the real thing is this large language model world that has been created. Um, I think the way I've started to think about it is the LLMs are morally equivalent to microprocessors. They're not everybody's going to be able to build them. They're pretty expensive to build. Will there be hundreds of them? I doubt it, right? So these things are going to become valuable components to building something new that I don't think any of us, I've said this to people, I mean, in the early days of cloud computing, none of us imagined where it would be 15 years later. I, I will state that categorically. Uh, it's so clear to me that the first day that Apple introduced the iPhone. Nobody could have imagined Uber. Well, maybe the Uber guys imagined Uber. <laughs> so I don't think any of us can actually imagine what 15 years later is going to mean in a post-LLM enabled world. But I do think that's where we are. We're kind of year one, year two, of maybe a 15, 20 year journey going into the future. And I think there's huge opportunities, obviously, in this uh, about how you use this technology uh, and, you know, to change economics back to my comment about economics. Well, that's interesting. So let's go back to this. So if if I kind of unpack at least my thought process, it typically three forces coming together that really drives the mega changes. It is economics, first and foremost. It is some sort of a technological shift, right? Be it the, the cloud computing performance was the bandwidth combo, right? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, LLMs actually delivering the types of outcomes that work uh, at a cost level that's affordable. So that's sort of the technology shift. And the third one, it would be some sort of a cultural, um, cultural shift, right? And you brought up Uber, right? Like, so Uber... You know, like me, me, me economy, you know, service, 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 like that was a core part together was the phone, right? We're kind of, we, we're shifting towards more consumerization of our, you know, consumer services, like having higher quality of delivery service in the, 
I think first wave of SaaS that I, you know, you led, I was fortunate to be kind of just learning, uh, you know, that it, it did feel like it was a significantly easier user experience while it wasn't a breakthrough, um, but there was, there was improvements there and that was another driver. And I, it feels like in the context of, you know, you mentioned storytelling and, and, you know, at least kind of communications and the level of noise, there's sort of this, at least there's a shift in my view from a, you know, seller centric world or producer centric world to, again, a buyer centric universe, right? Like, and, and I think, and that's sort of like the, if you think of LLMs, right? Like, you know, that empowers me to get the information that I need about a particular service, whether I'm looking at a relate to 200 page deck and I can instantly reimagine the book experience or some sort of uh, intracom support tickets that kind of that addresses my needs. So there's the sort of expectations of a consumer that I could self-serve myself um, at any time much, in a much more powerful way than I had been before, even in the enterprise context. What's your take on that, right? Like, do you, do you agree with that structure that it's not just the economics alone, but it's sort of maybe the main driver, but it's a combo of economics, technology, and some sort of a consumer behavior shift? Or, well, I, you know, and what leads, right? Like, you know, I'm assuming you, you would say economics lead, right? But maybe there's different well, patterns in different industries. I think in the end, products lead, but it's products that are enabled by a different economic I see. that you could not have done without the fundamentally big economic shift that occurred. I mean, just we'll stay with phones for a minute. I mean, until Apple did this, right, created a phone, which we could all walk around with, which didn't cost a ton of money. I mean, obviously expensive, but not like supercomputer expensive, right? Came up with, as we all know early on, a business model that helped the Verizons of the world, you know, subsidize this. So we all went, oh, my cost of entry is pretty low, right? Without all of that, uh, access to a camera, access to GPS information, all of that had to happen and a developer environment, which was simple, right? Mm -hmm. Before you could get an Uber, before you could imagine an Uber, you, you had to have a fundamental economically driven platform. It, it was, you couldn't have invented Uber without iPhones is my contention, right? It's, it's a requisite to have an economic shift. And I'm just using cell phones as an example of this to enable the creation of a product, which is different. And to your point, obviously, and this is the macro point, which, you know, 40 years ago, the economics were so bad, there was only three, 300, 3,000, 3 million people in the world that had access to this technology. Today, right, right it's in essence, you know, the whole planet, uh, but that's only because of economics. And now you have to imagine the future of what do you want the future to look like and software, the beauty of software is we can turn imagination into product. And the more it's, to your point, user experienced, you know, more like Uber, more like Instagram, more like things that we live in our consumer world, the better off we are in the enterprise, frankly, right? Right. But then to support your point, what the reason the chat GPT drove through the roof and adoption is it was fundamentally free, right? So the economics were subsidized for the consumers that allowed that for for but the, realize for the of, just yeah, yeah yeah i was just make a comment it's it's the cascading of things right. that have enabled it right if i did not have a, a mesh wi-fi network in my house if i did not have reasonable internet connected here if i did not have a laptop computer that didn't cost ten thousand dollars right if, if they did not have a cloud computing infrastructure that allowed them to train these things, you can never have gotten here, right? It's kind of this, we're building on top of the fact that we have made these big economic shifts, you know, in hardware and software and communications, right? That enable successive, right? 
uh, you know, innovations to occur. ChatGPT could not have occurred 30 years ago. Just couldn't. Right. I mean, the concepts existed. I mean, you can go read about neural networks from the late 90s. It's all yeah. there, right? But My mother not. was working on uh, on these types of system in the Soviet Union and Kiev Ukraine Institute of Cybernetics, right? But yeah, it was exactly. theory. It was theory. It's all right? theory. Yeah. yeah. It was you couldn't uh, actualize it yeah. oh. economically. Yeah. So the economics breeds the potential to go do this, is really the way I think about it, right? Great. So let's let's talk about and this is a really great way of framing it. And this brings us back to storytelling. So I want to quote. Uh, you from your last Stanford lecture, where you give advice uh, to a bunch of, uh, you know, folks that are probably brighter, like, you know, if you if you are this was a little bit more after after I went to Stanford, but still uh, very relevant to me, become a master storyteller story is something so critical to to letting people when you try to communicate with them get in their head story is how it gets there. So um, and, and you, you also kind of captured several different types of stories, which I loved. You kind of had there's three types of stories, men uh, against environment, men against other men or women against other women, obviously, to modernize it. And and um, um, a, a human against himself or herself. Yeah. Right. Yep. And I would probably argue that like if the environment is nature that I would probably kind of add in the fourth one per our discussion is now like human against the machine. It's sort of been an emerging up and coming trend, right? And we're all, everybody's anxious about that, right? Like our machine's gonna mm -hmm. take over uh, <laughs> as well. Uh, yeah. But tell us about uh, how you are applying storytelling, right? In your class, what do you see? You have some amazing business storytellers, um, you know, come to, to that you work with. You've written a bunch of books. You've worked on businesses that support innovative storytelling. So I would love to hear what's what's your take on, you know, any innovations that you're seeing in storytelling, what's remaining the same and will never change. You know, and obviously the whole topic is important, right? Like, but that will probably never change. But dive into that a little bit for us. Yeah, let, let me explain how I came to spend time in the world of storytelling. So um there uh, there is a book written i don't know now probably eight nine years ago called the challenger sell challenger sale and it's kind of curious it's a obviously a sales book and but it's not one of those where you go oh i was really successful let me tell you what i did they actually went interviewed a whole bunch of enterprise sales guys and tried mm -hmm. to figure out why some were more productive than others they ended up classing them into five big classes. What they discovered was the group that was 10 times more productive were the challengers. So mm. what the mm. hell is a challenger becomes the question, right? Well, a challenger teaches insight. I think these are two very interesting words, teaches and insight. So what the hell is insight? Okay, insight is, and this very, you know, prescriptive about what is insight. Insight is the gap between where you are today and where you could be. That's the insight. Okay. Now, it turns out Martin Luther King uh, and Steve Jobs, if you go analyze their speeches, they are structurally identical. They oscillate between where we are today and where we could be and where we are today and where we could be. Okay. Let's now take it down to something really concrete. Okay, most people know the I have a dream speech. Mm. So I'll distill it. I have a dream that one day my children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their heart. Okay, now take that. Let's get rid of the not part of the story. I have a dream that my children will be judged by the content of their heart. Yeah, Martin, I agree with you. <laughs> right. No uh, tension, why though. Are we, <laughs> yeah. Why are we hanging around, right? Yeah. yeah, no tension, no tension, right? Back to storytelling. So what did Martin really have to do? What he really had to do was sell you the not, right? 
explain to you why not to judge his children by the color of their skin. Okay, now let's bring this to our world of high tech. And I, you know, if you sit around with a group of salespeople, they'll all agree with you right away. I said, how many times have you been in a meeting where you go in and you deliver your pitch deck and you walk out and everybody in the room's going, yeah, right, yeah. And you go, you fist bump your VP of sales or your CRO and you go, we got this one, right? And then I go, uh, what happens next? And most of the people who are honest will say, we never hear from them. It's crickets. Mm. So you go, well, why is that? Well, what's happened here is you have delivered the my baby is beautiful speech. That's what I call it, right? Right. Uh, you know, and all they have done, because we've all been taught to do this, you know, relate to whatever, you know, here's why I'm cheaper, better, faster. You know, I'm going to keep repeating my cheaper, better, faster story. But the reality is all they're saying to you when they fist, they're saying, great job, Alex, is they go, I agree. You think your baby is beautiful. I agree with you, right? The number one competitor to any venture and any new product is not some other company. It's a status quo. It's why don't I just keep doing what I do today? Mm -hmm. And the biggest challenge the challenger has is explaining to you why today, if you keep doing this, it will not work. You have to sell the not. So now let's bring it. You spent time at Salesforce. Let's bring it to the world of Salesforce. You remember what the first logo looked like? Absolutely. No, uh, no software. <laughs> no software. Like, yeah. yeah. Well, of course, we all know there's software there. What, right. what was Mark really trying to say? What he was really trying to say is, yeah, hey, the way you buy software today, upfront licensing, that's stupid. That's wrong, right? Uh, the years it takes you to implement your software, that's wrong. The way you have to hire DBAs to go implement, that's wrong. Selling the not... I mean, that's up front, right? No yeah. software was the key, right? SanDisk, I always like to use them. You're I've right. never met their founders, but if you look at the word SanDisk, it means not disk. Most yeah. people know what SanDisk sells is, you know, non-volatile memory. <laughs> Get rid let, of let, rotational disk, yeah, yeah. right? So selling the not is the key. And this is where you tie directly to storytelling. So if you think about mm. storytelling and you just quoted it, I said, look, there's only, and I'm just quoting people who work in storytelling. There are only three kinds of stories, man versus man, man versus nature, man versus himself. You know, yeah. watch Netflix tonight or Hulu or whatever. You'll yeah. see it over and over again. It's the same yeah. story, right? Now, it, and you already touched on it. Why is that story interesting to all of us? Because there's a conflict in it. Mm. Without the conflict, right? Little Red Riding Hood was, you know, walking down and <laughs> got, right. got home and, uh, you know, cooked dinner. Uh, well, none of us would have repeated the story, right? You had to have yeah. a big bad wolf, right? So that conflict is identical to the not, meaning you are telling a story where you are intentionally creating conflict between where you are today and where you could be and why today staying with the status quo is not the right thing to do. And I think that's what's so hard. I mean, it's hard for all of us. I mean, I'm, I've been working on a new venture. Uh, we, we are calling this the pediatric moonshot. Mm -hmm. And one of the areas that we are working in is in essence how to build next generation AI applications in medicine. And we know one of the giant challenges in medicine is we cannot do it the same way we built ChatGPT, meaning we can't go centralize all the data, centralize the training, centralize the delivery, which is ChatGPT, any of the work we've done today. Why not? because the data is way ass bigger. 
What about data privacy? Mm -hmm. And you want to deliver to the point of care. Now, listen, I just explained to you really quickly why what we're trying to do today to do AI for medicine, for medical imaging, is never going to work. Now, if we're right, and I'd say we're, we're right, there'll be a group of people who will show up and go, you know, I agree with you. You must know the answer to the question of how do you do distributed learning, decentralized, federated learning. I don't even have to say anything. Right? I don't, if you so work basically this you way. have to out educate about the problem. You this exactly. fundamental what I'm hearing. Yeah. Exactly. And it's really interesting. And tell it by the stories. Yeah. Tell right? them by the stories. Yeah. Well, and I think the stories so we've been we've been um playing around with this ourselves, right? Actually, I, by the way, I sat next to the guy who designed the no um <laughs> no no the, the kind of the yeah. Ghostbusters yeah. logo, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And so yeah. It's interesting, uh, you know, may and maybe you could guide us on this, where like we, we and we at some point, because we were building a successor to the PDF, we even had it like no to PDF and we could have copied that Salesforce playbook and it was fun. But in reality, we actually PDF as an input for us. So it was sort of a confusing. And so you mm -hmm. like it's and it's sort of this challenge is like it sounds like it's not like that simple, like, oh, just we are the opposite of something. Right. You really need to still continue to pick stories and make them real and bring them to life and tell a story of a customer maybe that uh, your listener would resonate and how that customer is having the problem it's right it's not just some sort of abstract story right like when michael uh, uh sorry go ahead i i think i agree it's not simple to do this i mean yeah. i i'm not trying to say it's simple in fact it's oftentimes the most difficult because back to culture, we've all been trained to do the elevator pitch. I'm not doing an elevator pitch in any conventional sense of the word. So I think it's practicing the fine art of, right, who are you talking to and why are you telling them that what they're doing today is never going to work? And what substantive, you know, justification do you have? Because you could just say, well, it's not going to work. Okay, fine. <laughs> but why is it not going to work? How do I convince you that well, your path you're on is not going to work? And I think the more you can figure out what that is, the more you can now encapsulate it, maybe one day into a logo, maybe one day into the name of a company. I, you know, right. that's the ultimate distillation of this. But I think the pursuit of trying to understand yourself as you're talking to and who's listening right right uh to this is the key to this is like what who and don't be afraid i think a lot of people because they go well you're offending the customer you're telling them that they're stupid which in principle in fact you know i have a young company umnitsa and i was just coaching them on the same thing so they just did a entire pitch at gartner called Why Managing Enterprise Technology Sucks, <laughs> mm. right? What's wrong with it? it? It's, I think that's why it's hard because you say- You're calling well, somebody else's baby ugly, basically, is fundamentally- it, it, You in, are, yeah. you are indeed. Yeah. But if you're right, and this happened, I heard about it secondhand, but in the audience, in this case, the CIOs, Many of them, when they said, well, is that true for you? Yeah, you you're, you have put words to my frustration. It, Salesforce, you didn't need to find a whole lot of people to go, do you really hate paying like a million dollars up front and then paying 22% a year for support? Do you really hate how long it takes to, you know, implement, uh, you know, CRM from Siebel? Do you hate? It doesn't take a whole lot of time that a group, not everybody, but a group of people will go, you're right. I agree with you. It sucks. The What we're doing today sucks. And therefore, if you're telling me all this, you must have an answer. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's fascinating. We've gone on a journey at Relate To, and it sort of connects to the storytelling of really explaining 
to a communicator, the person that has packaged something and then sends it over to to why what they're doing is not taking into consideration the consumption experience of their audience, right? So we're talking about the same thing, right? Presentations, you, you mm -hmm. could think about presentation being delivered in person. If the person doesn't know how to tell a story in person, that there's all sorts of problems. But we live increasingly in the world where there's a lot of asynchronous communications, right? And the books are... Um, just as long as they've ever been, but our capacity to read long form content and digest it has de declined in the sort of bombarded world that we live in. And so what we've uh, noticed is that there's this really tragic disconnect, right? Really brilliant people working of your level of brilliance, right? PhDs, and et cetera, right? Are unfortunately not as versed in storytelling as you are. And so they put their hearts, their minds into producing some kind of content that needs to be successful. And for that to be successful, it needs to be distributed and communicated. And they mm -hmm. put zero amount of time in thinking through or emoting to what would be the consumption experience of their audience, right? Sometimes you get lucky, right? And they're experts. Sometimes Consumer tech is way more sophisticated about that than we would want it to be because it's selling us, you know, opioids for our minds and uh, and attention. But the this feels like a tragedy, and particularly in the AI world, like, like almost feels like, hey, if we can't help people digest complex information, we're going to delegate that to machines and a few superhumans that will going to be running these machines, and we'll just get dumber and dumber and dumber at processing this complexity. And that feels really sad. So this is the challenge that we're doing, you're trying to tackle. And I, I, I guess the part that we found, and I'm curious what your feedback is, the only way you could sort of really easily, quickly break through supports your theory. You, you say, hey, here's your PDF. Now I'm gonna pretend like I'm receiving this PDF and I'm gonna try to read it. And then I show people, oh, well, this is my default browser in Adobe, the way they have, have my PDF looks. So it shrinks, you know, from a full page, it now looks like it's 60% of that. And most people never click out. And if by some reason I see that it has like different pages, but I can't click into page 24 because there's no navigation that's obvious and there. And if mm -hmm. I'm on, I am on page 24, I'm totally lost of the context of where I am because there is no other markers. And if I click in a video, I live your PDF because I now go to YouTube where I'm going to be delighted by the latest podcast episodes of experience focus leaders or whatever, whatever I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. And so people get distracted and never complete these content unless they're incredibly motivated, unless they're just like off the charts need to read it, in which case, you know, great. Like how often does that happen? So when we do that, people go, oh, oh, yeah, I didn't never thought of it. But I, I just wonder, like, what's it in, in, our, in our nature that we just care about outputs and not necessarily the audience ability to process it, right? Ability to understand it, ability to take that understanding and act on it. And act on it now while it's hot versus hopefully act in it or remember it some other time. And this is just sophisticated marketers, sophisticated communicators are committing what in like it seems like blunders left and right. So I'm curious, because you you're advocating for storytelling. Have you seen progress in our ability to think through storytelling, communications, lending the messages, or are we kind of meandering? forever and ever because we're too me centric and not enough audience centric. I don't think anybody's made progress on storytelling. <laughs> you know, go look at anybody's website today. I don't care who it is. And, you know, 99 out of a hundred, you're going to see a, my baby is beautiful pitch. It's just, it's so countercultural, right. To think this way that, it's unique still. I don't think most people 
We're all trained on it. What's your elevator pitch? Give me your three slide presentation. Believe me, most people's three slide presentations are my baby is beautiful speech. Nobody wants to leave. This is well, there's my baby is beautiful, up. and I have a really smart team. That's yeah, oh, yeah, and let's that. add that one. That's slide four. Yeah. And we're just geniuses, yeah, we're not geniuses. according to our moms, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, we won't spend our three slides making sure you understand how bad the problem is. We don't do that, it's just culturally not there. Um, and I think that's why it's hard. It's hard for people. It's not, I go back, hire any CMO, you know, what are they going to do? They're going to, their first question will be, so what's the elevator pitch, Alex? What's the right. value prop? What's the value right. prop? You know? And I think it just, I know, I mean, it's, it's not, I, I, I've even seen it myself. It's not, you are so enamored with what you do that you are so eager to spend all your time talking about what you do because what you do is cool. Otherwise you wouldn't be doing it. Right. right? So you want to talk about your baby. You, that's exactly what you want to do. And it's so hard to have the discipline to back off and try to figure out, well, what's the story about why they should stop doing what they are doing today. I'm not going to tell you what you should do in the future. Remember, I made the comment about Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King's real job was convincing you to not judge his kids by the color of their skin. That was the job. Selling the not was the job. So it wasn't like paving the way. We are the disruptor of this. We're that. It's much more pre that to establish a sound footing for well, it's, what the future could be. but Which, not by the sure. way, means you have to have some comprehension of what the challenges are today out yeah. there, right? With the people that you're trying to talk to, right? Who is that? And what, what is their, what is the challenge they're facing? And how, with your insight, can you help them? That's, to me, that's the key. If you get that, it's not easy. I go back to this is not easy. It's this not is not easy. Matter. And I, I'll give a shout out to our to our friends at Salesforce. So we, we're very fortunate to to be supporting them was relate to. And they it's just a pleasure to see how they think about storytelling at an like organization with such a degree mm -hmm. of complexity. So um and this is this is public, so we're happy to share. So they they kind of have a large partner ecosystem, and so they built something that's nonlinear storytelling device we powered and it helps that you choose hey first of all what kind of a partner are you right because you have you can be isv or reseller etc click one and then great you know who are you at that partner are you a business leader are you a marketing leader are you this great mm -hmm. next level what's the problem that you have right and only and then you get into one magic piece once you pick that you're the you've got the persona you got the problem they care about you drill into that you could still look around and find other problems in other areas. But it, it sounds so obvious, sounds <laughs> so remarkably obvious. And I know that we have great customers and you know other great verse, very few start with that perspective in mind and create that level of experience. Um, and you know it's enabled now, right? Like there's people like us, there's other solutions for trying mm -hmm. to go nonlinear. Uh, in the storytelling, but uh, to your point, it's hard. And even you know, I'm, I'm, it's easy to judge from a hype above. I, like I, your baby is always um, harder to to adapt. So it, it, like to your point, it takes deliberate uh, intention to to really walk the mile in the shoes of your customer, and you know if they're. High heels, they're high heels, and they're sneakers, they're sneakers, right? And you got to really adjust to that. Mm -hmm. It feels like um, people almost run like run out of time for that step, right? Whereas it's it should be the first step, right? It's like it's almost like you know how people go, oh, I'm gonna you know put this presentation, I'm gonna work all night on the presentation, and then I'm gonna show up in your class. And I'm going to deliver this thing. 
and I'm going to be totally tired. I'd never practiced the presentation, but hey, the slides are there. The slides are there. So then you go prop up on these slides desperately. It feels like this is the case in some presentations, but more sadly, it's the case in actually more elaborate communications, right? Whether it's a website or uh, or decks and so on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, who are you seeing that's innovating in this area outside of Apple and maybe Salesforce, like my example? Who who is who is you know um, where's the, is the innovation happening in business or is it like do we really need to look at other other mediums, other parts of society where there is more openness to connecting to the audience? Well, I think you know. My point of view is progressively what we think of as consumer and enterprise are intermingling because we are the same humans that watch Netflix by day and, you know, sit in a vice president by night and sit at a desk at a, as a vice president in a bank. So, you know, I feel like the more we learn about how this is done well, let's call it in Hollywood and adapt and learn some of these techniques that's to all of our advantage right i mean story you know i tell people look here's another basics of story stories have person place and time they mm. all have person place and time you look at any of our you know these uh, customer reference stories <laughs> mm. first of all it's usually very vague who the hell the customer is you know Oh, a leading whatever, blah, blah, blah. Uh, right. Where did this happen? I don't know. Last year? Yesterday? Uh, and if you read them, they look like happy, happy, happy. They're like, oh, I was walking down the street. I discovered this cool technology. It's changed my life. Like, what? Yeah. <laughs> It's what an not, exciting movie. You know, what exciting well, it has movie. a boring movie, right? Yeah. yeah. In fact, anybody who's sat on reference calls, they all know what the reference call looks like is the guy asks the question or the woman asks the question. So what problems did you run into in making this decision? That's all the questions. The questions have nothing to do with, oh, are you happy? It's like obvious that right. they're happy with the decision. So, you know, if your story would not make a good movie <laughs> or or even an episode, and you don't have a story. And I I think we're not very good at this yet. We don't have, we use words like persona. I agree, right? But, you know, that I think we do it more from a segmentation point of view. Right. It's not a, it's not it. a, it's not a concrete not enough a person. Right. Yeah. It's not Alex or it's not Tim. Right. And I think we could learn a lot of lessons from how they think about things What's a good script that would make it onto Apple TV? I think those criteria are not a whole lot different than what we're talking about, right? And the more and, and back the story to is like the story is the, like let's let's kind of rework it, right? Like so, the, an interesting business story would be, you know, put a woman in the jungle, right? Have a tiger running after her, then she escapes the 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 tiger. Then there is a, you know, huge flood. She escapes the flood. You know, then there is something else. She escapes that. So this, like, you want to have this cascade of challenges and things you expected, maybe, but things a lot of that you didn't expect. And just when you are about to, to, to have a successful escape, another drop down, right? And so that's that oscillation is what you're you're trying to discover. So it's not like problem solution results yeah. thing right it's like problem solution problem solution problem solution problem solution big problem just when we thought everything was perfect and we went live solution and then oh okay here's the here's the actual outcomes at the end of the day and that's like happily ever after which we do want right like to some degree but what you're saying is that happily ever after is not credible at all if you don't have that oscillation uh, or well, you're or not, a... you know, this is like going, we all know how most movies end. If you go to the end and show the last five minutes, you go, that's the story. That's uninteresting, right? 
The real right. question is what captures, I, I, I say this to people, I go, look, the real challenge when you go explain, relate to, or anything to somebody is how much can they tell the story to someone else? That's the mm. real challenge. It's mm. the person not in the room when you were presenting, the person not in the room. What are they saying to that person not in the room? And so how do you program that, so to speak? Well, we all got programmed with Little Red Riding Hood and lots of stories so that we can tell the story of, you know, Little Red Riding Hood, any of these. I could right. tell you the story of Squid Game, right? Why can I tell you that story, right? Because they boiled it down and they communicate to me so then I can go, Alex, let me tell you the story of Squid Game. Here's what it means. Here's how it works. I can't, or maybe I can't tell you all the detail, like who died in the first episode versus second episode, but I certainly can tell you why, what the Squid Game storyline is. And you can repeat it to somebody and you can go, oh, wow, that sounds really kind of interesting. Maybe I'll go watch Squid Games. It's, well, that's so where is it interesting. is. So, so switching to business directions right like so there, there we don't have as much time as uh, let's say whatever is the netflix great latest and greatest installment right to to go deep into the narrative so how do you combine the essence of the story with the richness right like well that's because you there is a time limit right is there that's a trailer you just described a trailer you just described so every idea needs a trailer is basically what you're saying is every idea needs a trailer. Well, I, I've never sat down and talked to him, but I would guess that every movie that comes out, there's a tremendous amount of time spent on what the trailer is. And is the trailer one minute or three minutes. You know, how many, we all know Netflix pioneered this, you know, you flip through the, through the different shows and they just automatically play a i don't even think it's 30 second trailer right so trailers are the moral analog they've had to figure this out how do i get you in less than a minute to go invested yeah, enough to go deeper i'm gonna hit i'm gonna hit the play button to use that whole analog they spent a lot of time on that and i think that's just the same thing here is what What's the trailer for relay to? What's the 30 seconds? But what's mm. the one minute? Same thing. Mm. And believe me, if the story is just they go happily ever after into the sunset, we all go next. <laughs> I mean, just go be a student of those. You see it all the time. There's a conflict. You see the conflict. You may not understand who the characters are exactly, but you see the conflict. You see partial resolution of conflict. Enough that you go, kind of, kind of interesting. I wonder what they're masters at it. They're the best at it of any of us, right? So let's talk about who is who who could be the hero of a of a story in the technology world. I I have a feeling that when people say who's the hero, they go, ah, I'm the hero, right? Or my technology is the hero. And obviously, that's kind of the natural default. And you know, more sophisticated people go, well, no, you, the customer, you're the hero. Uh, and, you know, there's maybe different types of customers, right? For example, we have a creator and the consumer. They're both, um, um, you know, heroes to some degree that we're helping them, you know, for the creator to create the best work of their life, for consumer to dig into that difficult content and take something away from it and, make it make it theirs and I, I it took me a while to kind of get away with that you know little, little we're, we're just like a, a little you know robin to the to the to the super super superman uh batman persona of the the, the customer but what's your take on that like do do, cust do companies get that uh is or is it you mostly hear i you know our technology is the hero it saves the day type of things what, what what's your have you, you know, seen that pattern i just back it up nobody's doing storytelling really nobody 
So we already we already like a couple steps ahead of the of the of the crowd in this. Yeah, yeah, nobody's doing it. Nobody's. I mean, I mean, obviously, I'm being excessive here, but you know, I go. Everybody's been trained to do the one thing, which is come up with the tagline. This is another variation of this, right? Come up with the customer journey. Come up with the uh, you know uh our our uh, oh our uh you know what what words we're gonna buy on google it's all the same thing which is i'm trying to figure out how to tell you my baby's beautiful and my baby's beautiful has zero conflict in it by the way none none whatsoever that's fascinating and if there is no conflict there is no story back to that there is none there's no story nobody cares and hmm. nobody does what I'm talking about. Nobody, nobody. Like, I mean, you interview some amazing business leaders. Do you find that they also default to the mean? I mean, I'd say Mark Benioff, right? Like you've you've interviewed it. Well, you've Mark, interviewed obviously, Mark. we we used yeah. him as the example of what, yeah. but yeah, you know, and obviously I said Steve Jobs speeches look this right. way. But at the end of the day, you know. It's a rare, I mean, you mentioned alchemist. I mean, I sit down with, I mean, I just sat down with a young company. He, he mm. does not start the pitch out talking about what's broken today. He tells me about how, you know, he can improve restaurant, you know, productivity and whatnot. I mean, feature function benefit. We all got taught this. This is so counterintuitive to me. It's so hard for people. And do you see that the the more complex the narrative, the more complex the problem, the more important the storytelling becomes? Or at some point you say, hey, well, this is so complex. You only need the experts and the technical experts don't need the quote unquote BS, right? They don't need the stories. They think they're the experts. So you give them the facts. You know, you've you're obviously on boards of companies with very complex solutions. So, do you see any difference between the complexity level and the need? For I think it's you know just go back to the analogs. I mean, you know, uh, are there complex movies with complex storylines? I mean, Oppenheimer. Just use that from recent time. Mm. Fairly complex story. Fairly complex storyline. Right. Uh frankly, much more complex than Barbie. Just to use the other one, right? Yeah. So are the techniques used in both identical? I don't think so. They're not. They're not identical. Right. They're different because they are different stories. One fairly simple, the other fairly complex. But are the techniques used by the movie maker, by the producer, by the script writer, I could venture to guess that some of those fundamental things we talked about, conflict, ebb and flow, right? Contrast. They're there. There's contrast. You, see, right? yeah. you, you go dissect those two movies and you will see it. We all know this. Act one, act two, act three. This is classic playwriting. Has the same thing. Right. Act one, you set up the characters. Act two, you set up the conflict. Act three, you resolve the conflict. Right. I, I never, you know, I I got a lot of degrees and only took two liberal arts classes in my entire time, one history class and one English class. But I somewhat regret this because like there's a lot of really interesting things when you start to dissect this. You know, how are well, the why are some stories better than others? We this is now we're getting much deeper into the question. Some are better, obviously. Why? I don't know. <laughs> well, I think, like, speaking of science and, and, and liberal arts intersection, I mean, I think in a conscious of time, but I, I think this is a whole other topic because there's now increasingly more and more evidence, whether it's in behavioral science, and then there's the Stanford faculty that, you know, I've, I've been delighted to have, like, Jennifer Aker at the business school who talks and writes and does research on storytelling and using humor Mm -hmm. and all these things that seem like very opposite of, you know, conventional business, you know, focus, but they're actually providing evidence that this is what works, right? Like if you are 
laughing, you're more open to information, right? If you're listening to a story, you're, you're, the story takes you on a journey, right? And you're, you're, it's, it's a, it's a shortcut to how we were trained from, mm -hmm. you know, ions ago to communicate with our peers around the, the fire. And so this is fascinating connections of neuroscience, behavioral science, you know, evolutionary biology is all yeah. coming together. So for anybody listening who comes from scientific entrepreneurial background, you know, thank you so much, Timothy, for, you know, opening up this world. And I think somebody was your experience and your, your technical credentials to say that this, this is, you're spending so much time on storytelling to focus that in some of your Stanford class and to spend this podcast with us diving into that. It's been a treat and uh, of, of strong validation that it's a worthy cause to get this right for your career, for your company, for your mm -hmm. personal life. Um, and so storytelling rocks in business and in life is sort of this, the summary of this podcast. Timothy, where can people find you? How can they um, be a resource to on multiple projects that you have? So two things is thanks for that. One, I, obviously, I'm on LinkedIn. If people are interested, reach out, connect. Um, the other is, uh, you know, I came out of retirement three years ago to launch what we call the pediatric moonshot, which is to reduce health care inequity, lower cost, and improve patient outcomes for children locally, rurally, and globally. And how are we going to do that? We're going to create privacy-preserving, real-time applications based on access to data in all 1 million healthcare machines in all 500 children's hospitals in the world. And if they're interested in learning more, www.pediatricmoonshot.com. Uh, we already have opened up a YouTube channel. Uh, we actually have a Spotify playlist. Uh there's a series of podcasts by leading uh, pediatric experts uh, that we just are going to release like seven of these in the next couple of weeks. So yeah, if you're interested, you know, check in, check on that. Um, we, at least for me, it's my last great project. Amazing. Well, so inspiring to hear about this project, your previous projects, and your lessons learned that you've shared, not just with Stanford students, but with this whole audience uh, here and yep. experience focused leaders. Thank you, Timothy.